If you've ever used a landline, connected to the internet, or powered up a data center, chances are copper was doing the heavy lifting. It's a metal that conducts electricity flawlessly, lasts for decades, and somehow keeps finding new life long after it's pulled from the ground. But where does all this copper go once it's retired? Stick around as we trace the incredible journey of old telecom wire, from forgotten scrap to one of the most valuable recycled materials on the planet. We're surrounded by copper, hidden in old buildings, buried under streets, and woven through decades-old telecom networks. As those systems get replaced by fiber optics, what's left behind isn't junk, it's valuable copper. Copper doesn't wear out. It can be recycled over and over without losing quality. So that wire laid down 50 years ago? It could be powering your phone today. With demand booming from EVs, clean energy, and tech, the race to recover copper has never been more important. So how do we turn piles of old wire into shiny high-value copper? It all starts at the scrapyard. Before any recycling can happen, the copper has to be found. And that's not exactly easy. Telecom networks are packed with underground copper wire, hidden inside buildings, or pulled from old switchboards and towers. Some of it is removed directly by telecom companies shutting down old systems, while other batches are salvaged by contractors and sold to scrapyards or recycling centers. Once those big tangled bundles show up at a recycling facility, that's when the real work begins. First, everything gets sorted by type and quality. Workers and machines check to see whether the copper is insulated or bare. The best stuff is called bare bright. It's clean, shiny, reddish orange, and doesn't have any plastic, solder, or grime on it. That kind of copper can go straight to melting, but it's pretty rare in telecom waste. Most telecom cables are insulated in some way, wrapped in rubber, plastic, or PVC. Some are thick and stiff, like the ones buried underground, Others are thinner and more flexible, like CAT5 and CAT6 cables used for internet connections. These get separated based on their size and what they're made of, because each kind needs a different kind of processing. You'll also find aluminum cables and combo wires, like ACSR, which mix aluminum with steel. These have to be pulled aside and handled differently. Some recycling centers go even further, They'll also take apart motors, transformers, and old HVAC radiators, anything with copper inside. These parts might show up already broken down or in bulk, ready to be dismantled on site. Once the sorting's done, all the copper is grouped by grade, clean bare wire, insulated wire, slightly contaminated wire, or mixed materials. This helps figure out how each batch will be processed and how much it's worth. The cleaner the copper, the easier it is to recycle, and the more money it brings in. That's the goal, sort smart at the start, so everything goes smoother later on. Once the copper wires are sorted, it's time to strip off the insulation. And this is where the real magic happens. Back in the day, people would burn the plastic coating off to get to the copper. But that's not only dangerous, it's also illegal in many places now. Burning melts away part of the copper, ruins its quality, and releases toxic smoke into the air. You can lose up to 30% of the copper's weight that way, which means less money and more pollution. Now, there's a smarter way to do it. With the SuperStrip, a machine that's become a staple in modern recycling facilities. It's simple to use. You feed in the wire, pick the right size setting, and the machine slices off the insulation without scratching or damaging the copper inside. If something jams, there's even a reverse switch to clear it instantly. No fire, no fumes, and you get that perfect shiny copper that brings in top dollar. But when you're dealing with big volumes, like piles of telecom cable, it takes more than just one machine. That's where shredding systems come in. One popular setup is the QD600. It's a mid-sized beast that can process up to 800 kilos of wire every hour. First, a conveyor belt feeds the wires into a shredder, which chops everything into smaller chunks. Then, a magnet pulls out any bits of steel or iron before the mix heads to the granulator. Inside the granulator, things get even more precise. The chopped wires are crushed down further, and then airflow and vibration tables take over. 
These systems use light wind currents and motion to lift off the plastic and let the heavier copper fall through. The separation is so accurate, you can get up to 99% pure copper even when working with thin, tightly insulated telecom wires. What you're left with is two neat piles, one of clean copper granules ready for melting and one of recovered plastic that can be sold for use in construction or car parts. Once the copper has been chopped down into small pieces, the next step is cleaning it up even more. The goal here is to get rid of any leftover steel, plastic, or rubber, so you're left with pure, valuable copper. Even though machines like the QD600 already have built-in magnets, larger recycling plants often take this a step further. They use powerful spinning drum magnets that hover over conveyor belts. As the mix of shredded material passes by, these magnets pull out any last bits of iron or steel. This is especially useful for things like ACSR cables or old motor parts, where copper and steel are often wrapped together. After that, it's time for density separation. This part's pretty clever. It uses air and gravity to sort everything by weight. Since copper is heavier than plastic or rubber, the copper sinks while the lighter stuff floats or gets blown away. The process happens on something called an air table or inside a cyclone-style chamber where everything gets stirred up and naturally separates. Some of the newer systems are incredibly precise. Machines like the Gold River Water Separator can even catch copper strands that are thinner than a human hair, like the kind you find in shredded Ethernet cables. Just a few years ago, that copper would have been considered too fine to bother with. Now, it's recoverable. Why does all this matter? Because the more copper you recover, the less you need to mine, and the cleaner your batch is, the more it's worth. Every extra percentage point of purity means a better price and a more sustainable operation. Now that we've got clean copper granules or stripped wire, it's time to melt it all down and turn it into something new. This happens in a huge furnace, usually gas-powered, where the temperature shoots past 1085 degrees Celsius, the point where copper turns to liquid. As the copper melts, any last bits of dirt, plastic, or oxidized material rise to the top and form slag, which is skimmed off. Operators carefully watch the mix to make sure everything's melting evenly and the copper stays clean and consistent. Once it's ready, the molten copper is poured into molds to cool and harden. These molds are treated with a release agent, usually an industrial oil, so the metal doesn't stick. After a few minutes, the molds are opened, revealing solid copper bars glowing red hot. They're quickly cooled with water to lock in their shape and prepare them for the next stage. At some of the more advanced facilities, like the sarin plant, they go a step further using something called upward continuous casting. Instead of making solid bars, they pull the molten copper straight into oxygen-free rods. These rods are super pure, with nearly perfect electrical conductivity, and are used in everything from electric vehicle batteries to high-voltage power lines and data cables. Each rod gets shaped into heavy coils, sometimes weighing over three tons, ready to be spooled, stretched, and turned into brand new wire. While recycling wire and copper granules gets most of the attention, there's another part of the process that's just as important. Briquetting. Every time a motor is dismantled or copper is chopped up by machines, tiny bits of copper, called chips or shavings, are left behind. They might be small, but they add up, and if they're not handled properly, they're hard to store, easy to lose, and even harder to transport. That's where the 900 EVO briquetting machine comes in. It takes all those loose copper chips and presses them into solid, dense cylinders using strong hydraulic pressure. These briquettes don't just take up way less space, they're easier to stack, move, and melt down. In fact, compressing the chips cuts their volume by up to 90% and slashes transport and storage costs by nearly 80%. They also melt faster and cleaner than loose scraps, which saves energy and keeps oxidation to a minimum during the smelting process. And it doesn't stop there. While pressing the copper, the machine also squeezes out leftover cutting oil trapped in the chips 
up to 20% of it. That oil is then filtered and reused in the workshop. So nothing goes to waste. Every piece of copper, every drop of oil, gets another shot at usefulness. Now that the copper has been cleaned, melted, and cast into solid forms, whether that's billets, rods, or anodes, the last step is drawing it into wire. This is where it's shaped down to the exact size needed for modern electronics and telecom systems. The drawing process is kind of like pulling taffy, but with extreme precision. The copper is fed through a series of dies, each one slightly smaller than the last. This gradually stretches the copper into thinner and thinner wires. In the telecom world, some of these wires need to be less than half a millimeter thick. And that's no small thing, because even a tiny mistake in the thickness can mess with signal quality or increase resistance. Once drawn, the wires are often coated with special metals like tin, nickel, or silver to protect them from corrosion. Some wires are bundled into multi-core cables, others are cut into spools and sold to manufacturers. Every batch is tested, labeled, and barcoded so it can be traced from recycling plant to finished product. From there, it's off into the world. Maybe inside a new smartphone, wrapped around the guts of an EV charger, or running through a fresh set of data cables. The copper starts its second life, and eventually, when those products reach the end of the road, that same copper might be recycled all over again. Copper recycling might not grab headlines, but it's crucial to the global supply chain. With EVs, renewables, and aging power grids driving demand, we'll need twice as much copper by 2050. But new mines take decades. Recycling is our fastest and smartest solution. It saves 85% of the energy, cuts emissions, and earns big, over $6,000 per ton. Quietly and efficiently, copper recycling is powering the future one wire at a time. If you enjoyed learning how it all works, give this video a like and don't forget to subscribe for more simple stories from the world of factory processes and materials. Got a question or idea for our next video? Let us know in the comments. Until next time, stay curious, stay sustainable, and stay wired in.